people can't think outside AIDS anymore. And it's just a shocking, sad reality. The first AIDS meeting on the continent of Africa was in 1985 in, in Bangui. We were there with a few people who had experience on AIDS in Africa. And one of our problems was, how can you diagnose uh, AIDS in Africa in the absence of very sophisticated laboratory support? Even though by 1985 there was an HIV test, most of Africa didn't have access to it. So one of the things that we did in that meeting was to sit down and hash out the so-called Bangui criteria for the diagnosis of AIDS in Africa. The idea was what would be a simple way for a clinician to look at a patient and say that uh, this patient likely has AIDS. We say somebody who has a combination of certain um, signs and symptoms like major weight loss and if you have a combination of that you can say this is probably somebody with AIDS. They wanted a clinical case definition where they could decide that someone had AIDS just by looking at weight loss and persistent fever and so on. It gave something to clinicians in Africa to, uh, to diagnose AIDS. And that helped in the overall effort to count cases because we needed to know what was the impact of the, uh, of the epidemic. They could discover AIDS all over Africa at that point. They could say that we are all at risk, but they could say it's spreading around the world. They could say it affects women as much as men, because almost anyone in an African hospital could be diagnosed with AIDS without having to do the HIV test at all. Whole nations have been led to believe that, in some instances, that they've got large percentages of their population infected and, and doomed because of this sexually transmitted, supposed sexually transmitted virus. It's such a tragedy. Daniel, Jacob. Lot of people he, he, here. He's very sick and he's very dying. What kind of sickness do you see around here? It's HIV AIDS. What is AIDS? We don't know. We don't know. So here you're living in a mud hut, and here some trans come white men with doctors who you respect, and they tell you that there is now among you an invisible disease, that it, and it gets into your blood and can stay there unseen for years, and when it manifests itself, it's going to manifest itself in the forms of diseases you've always known. Maybe if you look skinny, if you lost uh, weight, maybe, they'll simply say, hey, you have AIDS, or you're coughing a lot, maybe, they'll say you have the disease. This cannot help but create extraordinary paranoia in people's minds. They say, well, what is going on with us? My neighbor next door has got, he's got malaria. Is that, that, does that mean that he's, uh, that he's actually got this dreadful disease that, 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 that the whites are talking about? Like I could be fed now, then the mentality is that if ever I become teen, then it could be one of the symptoms. I have to ask myself, why now? Why at this time? Dr. Christian Fiala argues that many doctors have misused the Bangui definition. In the era before AIDS, we, we had to admit we don't know the diagnosis and we could hypothesize. But nowadays, um, what doctors do is, well, if we don't know what it is, it must be AIDS. We did have patients with uh, the conditions we now regard as AIDS-defining, even before the advent of AIDS. People could have TB and not have HIV and fulfill the Bangui criteria. They'd lose weight, they'd have TB, uh, and they could look like they have AIDS when they don't. Is this Bangui definition still being used today? I'm fairly certain that in many parts of Africa where there's still no, little or no testing available, that that definition is still used, and I wouldn't be surprised that it's used in the poorer parts of Asia. This word AIDS, I don't know what it is anymore. I don't know what we're talking about anymore when we talk about AIDS. AIDS is one thing in Greenwich Village and a very different thing in Kampala, Uganda. I visited the World Health Organization's website searching for answers and discovered there are currently more than 12 different definitions of AIDS worldwide. So I turned to Dr. James Chin, former head of the WHO's Global HIV Statistics Unit, for an explanation. In some countries, they felt they were a little more sophisticated than in others. And uh, you have, you know, along with the epidemic of HIV, 
epidemics of HIV AIDS experts and some of them will not necessarily uh, adhere to any international definition they'll make up their own definition High school biology class taught me that diseases and syndromes cannot differ from country to country, like languages. It was becoming clear that HIV and AIDS were distinct, separate entities, and that AIDS was diverting my attention from the real culprit, HIV. Where to next? The place millions have had their lives changed forever. She says, we have your test result, you need to come in and get it. And I was like, tell me now, Cheryl. She was like, Kim, we really need you to come in and tell me. I said, then I know it's positive, Charlotte. You would just tell me over the phone. And she's like, Kim, don't panic. You can still have a normal life. I can still remember his face. I can remember his eyes. And all he said was, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I, I think you should put your affairs in order and you, you might have five years. I said, Cheryl, I have to get off the phone right now. I have to go tell my dad. He started crying. This isn't the way it happens in the movies. <laughs> it's 7 a.m. here in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm a little nervous because I'm about to go in for my first HIV test. Have you ever gone in for an HIV test? No. Uh, no. 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 Okay. Yes, I have actually, a few years ago. Were you nervous, apprehensive? I was, very frightened. The nearest testing center wasn't in a hospital or in a doctor's office, but on the main concourse of a bustling train station, beneath a few portable tents. HIV testing facilities are everywhere, from street corner kiosks to shopping malls. I'll be tested with a rapid test, which looks for antibodies to HIV. Before? No. Except, no. Never. It's our first time. First time. Wow. Is this your questionnaire? Yes. Okay. These tests claim to be HIV tests. I'm going to read from a section that's called, that says limitations of the tests. The specificity of the reveal rapid HIV antibody test for blood specimens in low risk populations has not been evaluated. They don't know, in their terms even, how well this test is going to work in people they don't want it to work in. Low risk. We don't think you're at risk. Tell me about your sex life. My sex life. Who us? Um... It seems you haven't exposed yourself to lack, sex, you're not homosexual, you're gay, you know your story. Yes. That's the way I do. In 1990, we flew to Romania to adopt a baby. We found Lindsay, and she was only two weeks old. But I can still remember that feeling, just holding Lindsay for the first time, thinking, now I, my dream is going to come true. I'll have one of those children. Before we left Romania, we had to make sure that she didn't have HIV. We had to find a doctor, and he did the test, and it came back negative. We flew home just after Christmas, 1990, and um, I thought we had it made. So I'm going to do a test, which comprises of two test kits. These two test kits are from two different countries. Why you are putting them being two, you want them to confirm each other. Can they be two different uh, outcomes? Then this one has a stamina, which is going to give us the final results. Can I just ask you something, as someone who's a little nervous, Okay. it seems like if this is positive no. and this is negative, yes. my life hangs in the balance on whatever this one is. Yes. But how do we know that this one's accurate when both of these were inaccurate? This one has been tested to be the one that is going to take out the results that are correct. Oh, so this one is more accurate than these two? Yes, according to what we have in this. So why don't we just use the more accurate one to begin with? Well, you know what? This, what if now the more accurate one has a discrepancy? How are you going to find out? I don't know. Rapid tests in Germany, it's not allowed for standard diagnostics. May I ask why? How come you don't use rapid tests for standard diagnostics? 
several professional organizations who decide as an expert committee on guidelines how to do things. None of these responsible uh, societies recommended for scientific reasons. We always say to our clients, even if you have tested here, you can go to other centers and go and test and verify your tests. You cannot say you're 100%, because you find clients going from area to area doing tests. And they come with stories that I was negative at a certain area and positive with you. How do they de decide whether they're positive or negative? We cannot tell because we are using a rapid test. It occurred to me that perhaps the HIV epidemic is reported to be so widespread in South Africa and other poor nations simply because they use these inaccurate tests. There's the saying that if, if you knew how sausages, what sausages are made of, most people would hesitate to sort of eat them because they, they wouldn't like what's in it. And if you knew how HIV AIDS numbers are cooked uh, or made up, you would use them with extreme caution. I decided to investigate HIV testing protocols used throughout the developed world. When we're testing people for HIV, the first thing we do is a screening test, and it's usually a test called the ELISA. But there are also now available rapid assays that can be used as screening methods. Because they're faster. And we all know faster and cheaper is more efficient. If an ELISA is positive, it does not mean that the patient is HIV positive. That's a problem. If we're using antibodies as a screening test to tell who's infected or not, uh, uh, very occasionally you can get false positives. So screening tests by themselves should not be used as a definitive measure of infection. That's why we use a screening test to pick up all the cases, but we use a confirmatory test to eliminate any false positives. Take it easy. I'll just get the site. It should be emphasized that most of the developing world uses only screening tests to confirm an HIV diagnosis. There are no confirmatory tests. The time now is 25 past. At 22, the results will be out, which is going to be 15 minutes. Nine days after returning home, Stephen Sherrill's pediatrician ran a battery of tests on Lindsay, including an HIV test, even though Lindsay had tested negative for the virus in Romania. Dr. McHugh called us and said, we run into some problems with the test the testing that you did at, at Methodist Hospital, and you'll need to come right in and see me. I said, well, what is it? She says, well, I can't, I'm not gonna tell you over the phone. I said, I need to know exactly what this is. He said, you know, we got bad news that, that she tests positive. And he said, she'll have a 20% chance of living to age two. That was just a shock, just a shock after all this joy and happiness. We finally found our daughter and I'm dancing around Romania and now I come home and it's like somebody could just stab me. And then I had to call my mom and that was the worst phone call I've ever had to make because I even remember saying that poor girl, she's just not going to make it. So that we don't have to go to somebody and say, well, you might be infected, but it might be a false positive. We do a second test. That's a test usually called the Western blot. In 1992, when I was told by my doctor that I was HIV positive, that was only a verbal admission to me. She didn't give me the written paper that came from the lab that tested my blood. I found out that it says this indicates possible infection by virus. There can be mistakes from the antibody test, and there are conditions that can cause the test to be inaccurate. Now that I've got the package insert for that test kit, it says positive results using any specimen type should be followed with additional testing. But this is the test that they use to confirm with. This has a margin of error done properly that's extremely low. In other words, it's one of medicine's better tests. I don't think the Western blot is a useful diagnostic test. I don't think it's worth doing. They give a reason. You know, anybody can say anything I think is stupid to drive a car. He but said come on, you got to give a reason. It's a useful prognostic test. Once you know that someone is infected, then you can follow their antibody response as well with Western blots. 
it stays absolutely wrong. It has a complete usefulness. You don't need a Western blot, and it's become a dogma.